How am I going? How you doing? How you doing? Good, how are you? Great. So uh, I'm in Prague and I just got finished uh, hosting a uh, working group and my Wi-Fi was iffy. Uh, so er Sarah Allen uh, is going to uh, lead the facilitation. Okay, cool. Not going to really change much for you. <laughs> just so you know. Yeah. Hi, Sarah. Speaking of the devil. You're muted. Hello. Hi. Michael's our presenter. Oh, am I the only presenter? Um, so I have someone that was slated from about a month ago, lined up for today, uh, but uh, Jerry hasn't been on the last couple of weeks and I haven't received a confirmation from her. So, um, you know, if, if she shows, uh, it's her slot. Uh, but, uh, if, um, um, you know, if she's not here, then, uh, uh we will, <laughs> yeah, the, then, then, uh, yeah, you know, the fact that you're, you're enthusiastic to, to get it in today, uh, is really fantastic because it, is it, uh, um, you know, potentially, uh, you know, lines that up. Sure. Awesome. Thanks. You bet. So I just added the notes, the calendar invite. Awesome, thank you. Hi, you're muted. Are you relieved that I've come? Yes, uh, though uh, I wanted to, to, to sanity check with you before uh, we went live. Are you ready to present today? I haven't seen you a couple of weeks, but I want to have your, you slated for today. I'm ready. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, so, Michael, uh, this is the priority. So, um, you know, Sarah, I recommend if we end up uh, filling time, then um, we prioritize that and not try to squeeze uh, both sessions unless it lines up uh, that we're you know, making a good use of time. So when you said this is priority. Uh, Jerry <laughs> is priority. She was on the schedule. Uh, Michael asked if uh, um, you know, th th it would be possible to, to present today. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I uh, said that we you know, have maybe uh, 20 minutes. So, um, and, 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 and Jerry, you know, one of the reasons why I'm managing expectations so much is I'm in Prague and my Wi-Fi has been really um poor and the last session that i was facilitating i was dropping a lot um so um sarah's going to be uh, facilitating today and then but you are recording i am recording uh and so we'll just hope for and I, I don't know any yeah, other way i don't know if do that. for me to take over record <laughs> I can do a cloud recording, maybe. 
I have a record button on my screen. Does is it possible for anybody to record? Go for oh, it. Let's... If not, I can probably upgrade your I, um, capabilities. I think you need to be a co-host. It rec it's request. Oh, wow. Jerry is the co-host. <laughs> All right. And now I think you should have the, uh, the privileges. So having a backup recording would be great. Okay. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, even if there's just like two minutes, Dan, um, and I can just point people to the proposal. I can add it on that we're going to put the talk uh, in mid-July. And so we're just trying to get the word out and get people more of an understanding of what uh, Falco is and what it does and how, how it can help in the security space for Kubernetes and cloud native apps. So. Excellent. Great. Yeah, happy, happy to uh, provide a platform for that. So Jerry, I, oh, yeah, I see you're recording, so yay. <laughs> and I'll volunteer to scribe. Um, is there somebody else who's willing to take notes? Michael, Christian. Sure, I can do it. I'm one of the usual suspects, right? <laughs> can you share the link? Where can I find the link? Is it in the invite? Um, I added it to the uh, meeting invite. I will also add it. Just I can find it. I can find it. So I just added it to the chat. Um, so yeah, and anybody should feel free to like add in notes. Um, I added the people that. Um, had names in the participants, but um, please feel free to up fix your name if I spelled it wrong and add your affiliation and um, any links or anything. Do we have any other orders of business, Dan, or should we just dive in? Yeah, so Doug, uh, Doug, are you dialed in? Someone's dialed in. Doug Davis of IBM uh, in, so uh, yeah, there's check-ins uh, in for the, the SIGs and working groups, and I did ask Doug if he would um, you know, share a bit of context from the TOC meeting. Uh, oh, great. Right. Uh, if mm, Doug's not here, uh, and since we have, uh, you know, full docket, I think we should probably go ahead and get started. Uh, I can, I can fill in a little bit of, uh, you know, my, my, uh, interpretation of that, uh, of what happened. Um, so, uh, you know, Couple things uh, were happening. So the the, um, the cloud events uh, uh, project is uh, cloud events is graduating out of the service uh, serverless working group, and uh, you know one of the uh, discussion points that, that was highlighted uh, was that um, you know that project that that working group. Uh, elevating itself to having code was seen as um, you know the uh, you know the best way to engage in uh, the CNCF. Uh, so I I was very yeah I did one of those. But it doesn't have code. It has a specification, and the working I'm part of that working group. Oh right. On. And people have done. There was like an interop demo, mm -hmm. but the group has not produced code. Hmm. So one of the things that I was very intrigued about was um, I thought that CNCF projects were all code-based. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time there's been a product project where the goal of the group is to create a specification. And it's kind of an open question. 
I think there's a lot of interest in creating shared libraries, but there has been, I haven't been actually at the, attending the meetings for a few weeks, uh, maybe a month, so things might have changed a little bit, but um, I hadn't noticed, I hadn't seen notes that it changed, but, um, but yeah, so there was kind of an open question whether it would be like lots of people doing separate interoperable libraries, more like IETF style, where like there's different implementations that interoperate, which is kind of where we would, what we did with the O1 specification, and so or whether the group would get together and build software together. Um, so um, so yeah, so was there discussion of that at the recent TOC meeting? Here's Doug. Uh, hi, Doug. Oh, <laughs> Great. We were, Maybe we were, Doug can speak to this because I haven't been at the meetings for a while. Uh oh. But I joined. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> this time, um, cloud events. Um, graduating from being a project of the working group to being its only its own sandbox project. Oh, okay. Um, uh, Dan was saying that it was that it was because it had code, and I was saying that I I think it, it like it was. To my mind, the first thing that had become a sandbox project that didn't have code. But maybe Doug, you can speak a little bit too. Yeah, we wrote a whole implementation while you were gone. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. Actually, uh, no. You're right. It does not have code as of today. The the closest I've heard about us having code is we started some discussions around possibly some shared libraries or or shared uh, uh, coding efforts around some shared libraries and stuff. Whether that would actually become part of our working group, or we just have pointers to a common open source project someplace. I haven't talked that far. I, I did think it was weird though, during the call, I think it was Alexis made a comment about us having code. And okay. I didn't correct him because I thought it was just an off the cuff remark I didn't think it was worth diving into. Um, I didn't quite understand what he meant by that, to be honest. Okay. It may be that the interop demo was mistaken as code that the group had built together. Maybe, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Okay, so it sounds like, you know, uh, we don't need to over-index on, on that thing. In fact, that, that was Doug's feedback to me when I uh, pinged him to, to, uh, to talk about this. Great, okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, that was the, um, you know, there, there was that discussion and then, uh, you know, there was interesting discussion around uh, projects that are only, uh, you know, uh, associated with um, with Kubernetes and whether they would be appropriate in uh, the CNCF. And there was, you know, a, a fair amount of debate there. Um, you know, it was it was fun uh, uh, for me since uh, you know Node.js, uh, Node.js Foundation was referenced a lot since we uh, in the foundation did chose not to. Um, Integrate and support user land projects in inside of Node, um, you know, just, and, and that was just uh, um, scale and scope. Uh, you know, the scope of of supporting and integrating, uh, and uh, you know, choosing which are the uh, blessed uh, user land projects that we choose to support inside of uh, the Node.js Foundation was created to uh, you know sustain the um, the Node.js uh, you know. Uh, project uh, was you know something that we, we could not um, sustain with, within the structure of, of uh, the Node.js Foundation as it as it stands. Um, so that that's you know tangential to um, to safe, but uh, you know was uh, generally interesting. Um, yeah, I, I thought the first half of uh, you know this week's TOC meeting was uh, was quite interesting. If you uh, yeah, have the opportunity to go back and, and give it a listen. Uh, I recommend that. Uh, Thanks, Dan. And uh, I don't I don't know if there are any other check ins from other SIGs and, and working groups. Okay, we should get started. So, are you ready for me now? Yeah, do you want to kick it off, Sarah? Jenny. Jerry. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm going to share my screen. Great. Um, 
you find that So let me know if you can see it. I can see it. Good. All right. So at the time that I proposed uh, giving this talk, um, I wasn't really sure what made sense for the group. But what I've decided to focus on is just what our experience was integrating our service with both Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes. Um, and I'll give sort of a high level overview of what we did in each case. And as part of that overview, I'm going to touch lightly on things like how we determine application identity in each of these systems and in each system, how the system APIs um, can be leveraged to perform some of the tasks that were required, which is probably indicative of the fact that those APIs should be designed with fine-grained permissions so that we can preserve the principle of least privilege in that kind of a situation. So the first um, case that I'm going to talk about is our integration with Cloud Foundry. Both of these integrations were customer driven where we had requests from some of our enterprise customers to make it easier for them to use our product on these uh, platforms. And the first customer request we got was for a Cloud Foundry integration. So um, that's the one that I'll talk about first. And as we started to investigate what that integration would look like very early on, we discovered the concept of a service broker. So what is a service broker? Uh, most of the time, if you have a service that you want to list in the Cloud Foundry marketplace, you're going to need to create a service broker. So the marketplace is a listing of all the services that are available. Create a to look for services on there. So it's a, it's a great way to make sure that your service is visible and easy to use for developers. So the service broker is just basically uh, an application that you also deploy to Cloud Foundry. And it has a handful of API endpoints that list the service offerings that are available, that allow you to provision an instance of your service, whatever that means for your service. And uh, that delivers credentials to access um, your service to the application. So you basically just need to implement a few endpoints and then you have a service broker. And the service broker uh, has to conform to the Open Service Broker API standard. And that standard has been accepted for use in Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, and OpenShift to degrees. So on the last side was sort of, um, I guess I would like to just show a little graphic of how this works. So you have your external service, you have your Cloud Foundry uh, installation, you deploy the service broker application to its own organ space to uh, seal it off uh, because nobody except you have and you need to access it directly. You create an organ space for your application to be deployed in. And in that app organ space, you would create a service instance. And creating that service instance is that provision step. And that communicates with the external service and uh, does everything that needs to be done at that step. Once you're ready to deploy your application, the application will bind to the service instance and communicate with the external service to get credentials to access that service. So, what I showed on the last screen was uh, step two on this screen. This, this is from uh, the Pivotal Cloud Foundry documentation. Um, there are other ways to integrate your service with Cloud Foundry. Uh, levels three and four both involve the service being deployed directly to Cloud Foundry, which is something we haven't explored yet. Um, and then there's sort of standard ways that, that you might interact with an external service, uh, like just providing the database credentials um, the usual way instead of worrying about the service broker. But that's sort of the possible scopes of doing it in Cloud Foundry. So having said all that, I'd like to just take a second and look at specifically what ours does. So uh, I work for CyberArk on the Conjure team. Conjure is a secure vault that people use to secure credentials required by applications. And so applications use these credentials to connect to databases or uh, APIs. So if you have an existing Conjure installation and you want to deploy some apps to Cloud Foundry, 
you'll install our service broker and we also created a build pack to make it easy to inject those credentials needed by the application into the app. And when you deploy your application, you're going to bind it to the service broker, which gives you credentials to access Conjure and creates an identity in Conjure for the application. You update the policy within our service to grant access to the credentials that the application needs. And then when the application starts, it uses those credentials to get the access keys that it needs to access other services. So, so that was our Cloud Foundry integration. Um, Shortly after, maybe even during the time we were working on that, we started to get a lot of customer requests to integrate with Kubernetes. And so in the next few slides, I'll talk a little bit about what that looked like. And it ended up being quite a bit different from the way that we handled things in Cloud Foundry. So even though Kubernetes officially supports the use of service brokers, it's still in pretty early stages. And if you actually look at, um, their code in GitHub, it hasn't actually had a stable release yet. So it's probably not something that is worth trying to use in production at this time. So instead of doing the same kind of model that we did in Cloud Foundry, we decided on a, a completely different tack. So one of the big differences is that in Kubernetes, um, we facilitate deploying our service to Kubernetes as a high availability cluster. Um, and then our service has a special authentication plugin that's specific to Kubernetes, and each application is deployed with an authenticator container that interacts with our service and delivers a time-limited access token to the application so that it can authenticate with our service. So this is just a, a graphic of our workflow. Uh, what happens is the authenticator container that's deployed with the application starts out by submitting a certificate signing request to Conjure with this 50 ID with the pod information contained. And Conjure responds by injecting a time-limited certificate into the pod using the Kubernetes API. Using that uh, pod information that was included in the cert request. Then the authentic with certificate and that authentication process results in a time limited token being placed into this shared memory so now the application has access to a time limited access token in this shared memory and it can use that token to retrieve um, whatever information it needs from the external service and initiate that connection to the external service so I'm hopeful that this kind of a model um, might be something that other services also find useful or that the way that we've implemented it means that uh, external services would actually be able to use the application identity we provide in Kubernetes to authenticate uh, Kubernetes deployed applications themselves. Um, so I'm curious to see where this will go right now. It's only available for our enterprise customers um, because it is a... Uh, still an app open source that will be released at the end of the month. And that open source release is going to include both the custom authenticator that we use, which is specific to our product, but could be a good model for other products, and the authenticator container, which is deployed together with the applications. So having sort of covered what we did, both in Cloud Foundry and in Kubernetes, there's one last thing I would like to talk about and that is uh, the developments that have been happening in Cloud Foundry since we created our integration there. So since we did our Cloud Foundry integration, uh, Cloud Foundry has released something that they're calling app instance identity, which just basically means that every instance of every application deployed in Cloud Foundry is deployed with an X509 cert and a private key pair that encodes its identity in the CF deployment. So it has information about um, the application GUID, the instance GUID, and the org and the space that the app is deployed in. And so 
my hope would be that we might be able to change our uh, Cloud Foundry integration to leverage these certificates uh, similarly to how we have been operating in Kubernetes. So in our Kubernetes integration, we basically turned Conjure into a certificate authority for the Kubernetes deployed applications and um, configured Conjure to accept the Conjure generated certificates as proof of identity via mutual TLS. Um, we might be able to modify our existing uh, Cloud Foundry integration to work in a similar way to have an authenticator build pack is probably how it would work uh, that would take on that role of communicating with the custom Cloud Foundry authenticator to inject a time limited access token into the application memory. So where is it now? It's not yet Swifty compliant. I expect that they may be working on that though, um, and that may change. And they're working on improving the specs on the workload for accessing the certificates and validating them against the certificate authority. So I think this is really interesting. I'm really glad that things have progressed this way in Cloud Foundry. Uh, which also led me to the question of how long it might be until Kubernetes also is uh, updated to come with app identity out of the box. Um, we know that Spiffy is currently a sandbox project in CNCF. Um, I think it remains to be seen where that's going to go, but uh, it's an interesting time to be talking about application identity. So at this point, I would ask if anybody has any questions and I will do my best to answer them. And this was sort of, I, I didn't try to plan something very in-depth or um, low level if, if there are things that come out of this that people would like more information about or would like me to dig deeper into another time, I'd be happy to, to consider doing that. Um, I don't know if people have a way to get in touch with me, but I'm on GitHub, so my information is there. I think we're also all on the calendar invite. Okay. Um, and if anybody's not on the calendar, invite um, uh, Ping me or Dan, if you to, um, or JJ. And I will uh, add a link to these slides, a PDF of these slides in the minutes so that if people wanted to go back and refer to them, they could. Um, in particular, I have this note here that if you're curious about looking at the code for what we did for our Kubernetes integration or for the Cloud Foundry service broker or build pack, it's all publicly available or will be by the end of the month. Uh, we'll announce the Kubernetes on our website, conjure.org. So that would be a good place to watch out for it. Great. Awesome. So, um, so I did just a question. Um, like you called out that this notion of instance identity and if that were actually a thing that was consistent across platforms, that um, seems like a um, very clear opportunity and, and um, that it would have made some of the work easier um, or at least you could have leveraged the same work perhaps across the platforms. Um, but I, and I'm wondering whether there's anything else in um, the sort of aspect of secure aspect of secure access where you saw that where you had to maybe implement stuff in application logic or you saw things in one platform that you wish were more ubiquitous, you know, and if you could kind of speak to those kind of challenges and opportunities. So to have a consistent way to identify applications, um, no matter which platform you're in, seems to me so valuable. We're one service, but there are a lot of services out there that are trying to do the same kind of thing. Um, Pivotal has a great relationship with the people that add services on their platform, and through them I've encountered a lot of other people trying to do this kind of work. And so. I think everybody would be glad to see a secure and consistent way to validate the identity of applications. Um, one other thing that I really only like, lightly touched on, but I think is really important too, is making sure that um, these platform level APIs, so in, in Cloud Foundry, it's the Cloud Controller API. And these guys, um, you really want to design them so that you can give granular uh, access so that 
you can um, provision a service account that can only access certain routes or um, uh, and as, as granular as you can make it so that if I want to develop something that could use that API, for example, if I want to validate that there really is a, a pod in a given namespace using that API, I don't, I don't want to have to give that service account really expansive permissions to be able to do that. I want something that I can just allow it to ask this one specific question that I want it to ask and then not give it any other permissions so that if somebody were to somehow get those access credentials that the service account has, they're not going to be able to go very far. So, uh, sorry, hopefully uh, my connection can come through. Uh, so, uh, Jerry, one thing I, I wanted to, you know, since, since you were presenting, I wanted to, to make sure you saw in the chat that uh, Doug is the co-lead of uh, uh, the Open Service Broker API specification. I did see that. Actually, I'm, I just yesterday finally got my legal department to approve uh, me as a contributor, so I have a PR open. <laughs> nice. In that project that I need to go back and review now that they finally, it's been months, it took them a very long time to approve it. So I will be doing that probably in the next few days. Congrats. Cool. Thank you. Uh, beyond, beyond that, uh, I had a question, you know, uh, in addition to Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry, are you looking at supporting any other plow, uh, platforms? Are you supporting a, um, a, a platformless, uh, you know, not one of those two? <laughs> uh, yeah. So we do supporting? have other stuff. Um, for example, we have a, a custom authenticator for IAM, and then we have a, a workflow that we call Host Factory that. Uh, people use if they're deploying like VMs to AWS. Um, I don't know that an implementation as specific as one of these would be required for most other workflows. It's one of those things where when it comes up, we'll know it and we'll have to deal with it, but it's not come up right now. Okay. A lot of our more general tooling has been workable for a lot of different systems. Mm -hmm. well, the, the reason why I ask is just, you know, I think that's a great perspective. Um, you know, knowing those use cases where, where folks have things that go outside of the, you know, the cloud native uh, workflows and, you know, being able to validate, uh, w you know, the approaches that we have in that, um, you know, non sort of, you know, cloud native blessed cases uh, is, I think, interesting to, to our work. Thank you. Jerry, you mentioned a custom authenticator for IAM. Is that AWS IAM specifically? Uh, I think that's the focus at first, but I'm hoping that it will be more general. We have customers that use GCP. We have customers that use Azure. So I'm sure we'll need to address all of those cases. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. It was fun. Does anybody else have any questions? I guess the only question I would ask, how would you compare um, it to Vault and what Vault's doing with the Open Service Broker, uh, HashiCorp's Vault? So I know that Vault has a service broker. Um, I don't know uh, how much they're doing with that or, or how it's being used. Um, I do like that our solution also has the build pack, which makes it easy to inject the secret values into the application at runtime because it installs summon, which is our tool to do that. Um, so I do think that's an advantage for what we've done. But in terms of you know having a service broker, I'm sure it's very similar. Okay. Right. And so like you have to end up building something like summon to get the secret from Vault at runtime. Uh, so because they don't have summon, you're probably like modifying the code in your application to use a client library or something like that. The summon just puts the values in the environment of the running process.
All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. So I don't know if we have, um, if Dan has connectivity, but um, we can, it looks like we have time to um, have uh, Michael talk about his use case and then project. Thanks. Uh, sorry, my wife just asked me if my son can do piano and he's right above me. So I have to <laughs> tell her no. <laughs> uh, let me just share my screen. Um, so I'm not sure how much uh, everyone knows about Sysdig. Um, Sysdig uh, is started off a company with an open source project that focused on uh, capturing system calls. So easiest way to think of uh, Sysdig is um, TCP dump for system calls. So what we can do is we can look at a Linux-based system and we can see all the system calls that are going through it and then capture those system calls into what we call an SCAP file. And then that SCAP file then can then be used to go back and see what was happening on the system uh, from a system call perspective at that time. And so what we did is we took that same similar concept of capturing system calls and we wrote a rules engine around those system calls. And that's really what Falco is. So it allows you to detect abnormal behavior inside of those system calls. Um, we specifically have focused on container-based systems, although it will work for any Linux-based system, and uh, it is Linux only right now. Uh, and this is kind of where the market is starting to kind of define this term, uh, what we call runtime security. So we're definitely not the only ones in this space of runtime security. Um, there's other tools out there such as Twistlock and Aqua. Um, Fresh Tracks also does some things around this as well. Um, and there's one other, I think, Stack Rocks uh, as well. So this is starting to kind of become this more burgeoning space around runtime security. But we're the only ones that offer a open source solution to runtime security. And we also offer a, a proprietary uh, version of Falco as well that gives you a lot of features out of the box. So what this uh, abnormal detection can do can detect things like shells or processes spawned inside of a container, uh, unexpected outbound connections. Uh, so all of a sudden, your database container starts making outbound connections to the internet. That would be something that would be abnormal. Uh, processes start listening on ports that you don't expect, uh, binaries being changed inside of a container, and so forth. Um, the way we want to look at this from a security perspective is while we can do things in the image build process using Puff and Notary uh, and image scanning to make sure that we're not shipping things with vulnerabilities or we know what we're shipping inside of a container, when the container actually launches, most container runtime environments are not immutable. Uh, so uh, containers can then make changes to their environment once it's up and running. So installing new packages, uh, modifying things, and so forth. And what Falco allows you to do is that when we detect this abnormal behavior, we'll notify you. Uh, and that uh, notification is up to you to determine how you want to process it. So while you need it, or, or why do you need it? So the cloud native paradigm really gives you a lot of choices. Uh, it pushes choice down to the development teams, right? Developer, developers can package up their application inside of a container. Um, and let's just say you don't always know what's inside of that container that development teams have packaged up and want to deploy to your production environment. Uh, image scanning is seen more as a point in time, so when you scan the image, you know the image doesn't have any vulnerabilities. Uh, but when the container image actually goes to production, there's a lag time between when you scan that image and when that container image is actually running. Um, as I mentioned, uh, running containers aren't necessarily immutable unless you specifically have them running in that way. Um, the resource isolation paradigm of containers is much different than VMs. And we see this as a need uh, in the market uh, when you see things like GVisor and um, with product containers as well that have come around as well that seeks to provide that more uh, VM-like isolation for containers. And so 
what Falco can detect is uh, vulnerabilities and things like container isolation, uh, exploited applications, uh, things like exposed dashboards or exposed API ports where all of a sudden images start getting launched that we don't expect, which the last one exposed dashboards and API port is kind of a common thing if we think back to the uh, Tesla, uh, the Tesla hack, it re really wasn't a hack. Tesla just left their Kubernetes dashboard wide open on the internet. And also what you can do with Falco is uh, begin to enforce best practices around things like CIS, PCI, SOX, and everyone's favorite, uh, GDPR, as well as organizational security best practices. So a little bit more about how Falco actually works. Uh, and I'll just show a couple other slides and I'll give you a quick demo. Is to certain functions inside of the kernel. Um, it uses something called trace points uh, inside of the kernel. And then we have an alpha, an early alpha version of an eBPF probe that can be loaded up as well. Um, that has limitations, of course. You need to be running a newer version of a kernel uh, in order to take advantage of that. And it needs to have eBPF support uh, uh, built into it as well. So for those of the, the people who aren't necessarily comfortable with the kernel module level of integration, then we can do it with eBPF as well. Then uh, this basically the stream of system calls will come into the processing libraries and the event engine. Um, that is then uh, uh, rules are applied to that event engine. as far as alerting is concerned. Uh, so we can log to syslog, we can log to a file standard out, or we can execute a program. Uh, that program could be something uh, uh, that then goes and posts to a webhook or something like that. What we wanna try and do, and why uh, we're actually presenting Falco as a potential sandbox project to the CNCF uh, talk, is that we see a lot of uh, uh, possibilities that if we could have other event streams where we could take this rich uh, rules engine and apply these rules to this other event streams, uh, and then also having more generic notification providers as well so that we could hit a webhook natively from Falco if we could hit uh, or push to something like a, a messaging system like NATS or something like that natively inside of Falco as well. So that we can kind of be this rules engine and then uh, uh, from a modularity cloud native perspective, we can have other event streams that are actually sending us data that we're processing. Um, a little bit about the project and growth of the project. We're actually seeing uh, lots of uh, usage, at least from a, a downloads perspective and Docker Hub polls as well. Uh, so we're well over uh, three quarters of a million Docker Hub polls for our images. Uh, about 34,000 downloads of the actual RPMs themselves. And uh, of course, everyone loves GitHub stars, so we're about 805 GitHub stars as well. Uh, users of note, so uh, Lyft has used us for a while, and we're in the process of trying to document that story from them. But another great one is cloud.gov. So cloud.gov, uh, uh, and by the way, this presentation is linked in the, uh, uh, the issue that I opened to do the presentation, which is in the notes for this meeting. Um, but this right here is actually cloud.gov's documentation that actually talks about how they have this behavioral monitoring in an experimental mode right now um, in their cloud, or cloud Foundry environment for cloud.gov. Uh, and then they've also given a presentation at the Cloud Foundry Summit as well about detecting tainted apps uh, using Falco inside of Cloud Foundry as well. So it's not just something that can work with Kubernetes. Uh, it is something that can work with uh, Cloud Foundry as well. Um, and so uh, I'll kind of let you look at the, uh, uh, the rest of the presentation on your own. Is there, are there any questions? And I can just give people a quick demo and kind of show how it works very quickly. Demo would be neat. Okay. Um, there's also a good presentation, um, which I can drop in the document or in that uh, meeting minutes as well. 
there's a good presentation around runtime security that Google gave at KubeCon EU uh, just a few weeks ago. It kind of lays out uh, uh, what are the areas of security that you need to worry about and kind of defining what the space of uh, uh, runtime security is and what runtime security means and how it's different from supply chain security or infrastructure security. So let me stop my share and share my entire screen. Uh, all right. So what we have here is I have a bar in my way. So uh, in this environment, I've got uh, a couple different um, things up and running. So the main thing is, is that we have Falco up and running here. Uh, this is deployed as a daemon set. Uh, we provide a daemon set uh, for users to actually quickly deploy this. Uh, all of the configuration for Falco is stored in a configuration map on this daemon set will then uh, pull down that configuration. Uh, so all of your rules and things like that would be stored in a config map. And then those rules are pulled down when the uh, containers launches or the pods launches launch. Uh, the other thing that we have in this environment is NATS as well. And so NATS is as, uh, acting as our messaging platform. And what Falco will do in this demo is it will push an alert over to NATS. Uh, and then we have Kubeless running as well. And what Kubeless is set up to do is it's set up to listen to uh, a particular topic or a subject in NATS. And when it detects a critical alert, it will actually go and take action. So let me show you what the rules actually look like. Um, so in the... Um, the rules use a pretty uh, simple language. Uh, it's the same language that we use for um, uh, Sysdig. And what this looks like is you basically just have the field and then some value, and then you can string it together uh, with other values as well. Um, there's a lots of different uh, Boolean logic that you can do inside of the rules as well. The other thing that you can do is you can key off of uh, Kubernetes metadata as well. So Falco will connect to the Kubernetes API server and pull that information back. So you can say, for this particular application that's running in a certain namespace with a certain pod name, with a certain label, uh, I want to be able to take action on it. Rule uh, crypto miners running inside of Kubernetes. So. Uh, we take the node front end application, and if I spawn a process uh, and I'm in a container, uh, so basically I'm not running on the host system, and my command line contains uh, stratum TCP, which is a common protocol that's used for miners, then I want to throw this alert. Uh, another example is you can list out uh, all like common miner ports in this case, uh, and if I see a front end application making an outbound connection to a minor port, then I want to throw a critical alert as well. So you can see the rule language is actually pretty flexible. Uh, uh, it's also fairly simple uh, as well. And then also what we have is over in the kubeless side of things, we have a very simple function that basically says, if I see a critical alert uh, and I'm not running, I'm running inside of a container, then I want to actually take action on that. And it, what this will actually do is that if I detect a critical alert running uh, inside of a pod in Kubernetes, we'll actually go and delete that particular pod. Any questions before I run this real quick? So uh, this is a Node.js uh, app. I, I have a quick question. Um, um, yeah. How is this um, secured? Can anybody else inject a critical alert and use that for a DDoS attack on a pod? Yeah, so the way it would be secured, uh, at least in this particular case, is that you would have security on that so that only certain people could actually log into that. Um, the other thing is, is people would have to get access to the particular um, host system and they, um, the, they, they wouldn't necessarily easy be, easily be able to spoof uh, that it was coming from a particular container. 
because it, you have to be inside of the container and then we're actually looking at the system calls themselves inside of the Linux kernel. Uh, so you would have to somehow spoof the system calls to say that it's uh, uh, this particular process is being ran from a particular container. Uh, the other thing that you can do as far as NATs is concerned is, of course, use TLS uh, so that you're making encrypted connections uh, into, into NATs as well so that people can't easily go uh, and see what's being sent. Or if you're using uh, mutual authentication, uh, then only certain people being able to connect to the NAT server. Uh, but if somebody is able to get to the host system and uh, spoof this and DDoS this, then you probably have worst case, uh, uh, or you have probably have worse situations going on in your environment uh, if somebody is able to get to the host system and, and spoof things. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Yep. Um, so the first thing that I'll do here is I'll go and connect to, uh, let me just pull this. So uh, I have a Node.js application up and running, but since Dan's on the phone, I didn't know if it was appropriate to remotely exploit it. <laughs> sure, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let me just jump onto this front end uh, machine real quick and I need to pass flags. And so the first thing I'll do is I'll just um, just run a bash terminal on it. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, of course, when you jump to the demo, nothing starts working right. I need to specify my namespace, and there we go. So you see right away that I've um, opened a terminal, and I get an alert right here over in this uh, Falco pod where I'm tailing the logs, and you can see that. Uh, I've opened a shell. So a shell was spawned inside of a container with an attached terminal. So somebody's went interactive inside of this container. Um, so what I can do now is I can run something that will actually trigger the alert. So let me actually go over here and see if I can get this to work. It wasn't working earlier via the remote exploit, but let me see if I can get it. And so this is actually sending uh, a profile cookie. Uh, this profile cookie is actually encoded and this application uh, doesn't actually sanitize the inputs from the cookie. And there's a way that you can actually exploit uh, JavaScript by doing, uh, uh, it's essentially a form of just-in-time execution that you can inject functions inside. The application was poorly written and somebody's not sanitizing the inputs. And if I click send, let's see if it works. Uh, it didn't work. So let me go over here and let me just do it this way. So I'll just do a curl. And remember that rule that I had open that if I had stratum TCP in the command line, uh, it would throw a critical alert. Ah, uh, and of course, my demo doesn't work, but uh, it should actually go and kill that particular container uh, and shut it down. Um, and of course, I tested it before I got on the call and it worked fine, but um, it should have shut that container down, but you can see that it is long. So if I did touch, then hello, uh, I get an alert right there that I've modified uh, or I've created that new file. Uh, if I did something like move bin ls to uh, bin ls old, uh, I get an alert right there as well that I'm modifying things in the binary directory as well. Uh, and these are all kind of common things that you would expect somebody who's getting into a system to do uh, as they're trying to compromise a system. So with that, I'll ask if there's any other questions uh, for anyone. So I have a general question. I might have missed the context for, for why we're talking about this. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, what do you mean uh, context? So, um, so and, you, and you can 
feel free to throw this back at me and say I did a bad job of this too, because I think I might have. I might have did a bad job of explaining. So, <laughs> uh, so it's the secure access for everyone working group. So I guess maybe I'm asking this of you and of me. Like, what is, what is, uh, how does what we're talking about relate to the charter of the group? Uh, I would, um, I would throw out there that it may not necessarily take care of the access perspectives of things uh, and the authentication perspective of things. I was actually under the impression, uh, the impression that the working group was more focused on um, uh, cloud native security in general and how you solve that problem of cloud native security in general. And if I'm wrong, then uh, I wasted everyone's time. <laughs> well, actually, I am. Um... I think we're we're also working to tighten up our charter so that it's clear to newcomers. So, um, but I, I, what I wanted to ask is kind of related to this. Mm -hmm. So what we're really seeking to do is kind of figure out, um, is there a common or maybe a few common secure architecture, right? What are the mm -hmm. um, things that if you are coming to setting up a cloud native um, deployment, what do you need? You know, what are the things um, that every cloud deployment should have? And what are the patterns there? And particularly with regard to solving these problems where different clouds have to interoperate and there's kind of complexity in hybrid systems. And so I'm curious in um, this work you're doing, which um, you uh, made efforts to make it work uh, in Kubernetes, not in Kubernetes in different places, are there some things that you are seeing in patterns that have made it easier for you to build something that works in multiple environments in the cloud? And are there areas where you've had to kind of fill in gaps and do things that are substantially different in different environments where you kind of wish there was a little more commonality? Yeah, uh, I think that where the challenges are gonna come in, um, from the different clouds and what we've seen is that um, it's important to provide context in these security events that we're throwing. And so uh, uh, in this case, we're only integrating in with Kubernetes. We can also integrate in with Mesos or Marathon, but we can't pull any metadata right now back from something like Cloud Foundry. So when these security events happen, uh, we want to be able to access the API and give people information about it's this particular application or it's this particular pod, or it's this particular deployment that's actually the, that's causing problems. Uh, the other thing is, is that we need API access and getting those uh, API access and authentication to those different platforms uh, can sometimes be challenging. Um, and then the other thing is, is that if you're going to take action inside of that, how can you limit these functions that are taking action, especially if you're using something like um, uh, functions as a service or serverless functions, how can you give them the right level of access to just do that one individual thing that they do uh, uh, without being able to compromise the entire system? And I think that kind of goes back to, um, is it Christian? Well, Jerry yes. had brought up yes. that point, but maybe Christian well, did too. Christian mentioned earlier, right? Yeah, of, of how do you know the like you're not DDoSing it and the thing that is taking action is actually taking, uh, is supposed to be taking action, right? And how can you not trick those functions into killing something that it's not supposed to? Um, the nice thing is, is that if it is a uh, but it is definitely a challenge that we see. I think more broadly, um, and this isn't necessarily a knock against the CNCF, but if you look at the CNCF landscape, security is one area overall, whether if it's authentication or runtime security or infrastructure security, it's not anywhere on the landscape whatsoever. Um, there's admittance control, which allows applications in. There's things like network policy, but, um, I kind of personally feel that security is one of those areas in that landscape that's missing. I agree. I've actually given the same feedback. Um, and they told me to feel free to add myself. So I don't know if you've added this. 
<laughs> and starts to fill it out. Yeah, and we've I've I've opened up an issue on the landscape to say like where does Falco fit? Where does our commercial product fit? Uh, and so it's still TBD to figure that out. But as I've talked to some members of the talk, they're like, well, we're not security experts, so um, it, it's hard for them to kind of digest some of this information. Yeah, and I think that that's kind of that's part of what we are trying like trying to help with, right? Is that um, it's also hard to put just be. I don't know. I, I have mixed feelings. Like there are things you need for security, like authorization, like identity. Um, there are these different things that you need that are, are kind of in their own security world. Mm -hmm. But um, but everything needs security. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so how do we actually sketch out that landscape? I can't think is one of the the questions of this working group. Um, yeah. And uh, and so. We're not there yet. Yeah. The, all of these use case presentations are a way for us to get common language and to understand the problems that people are trying to solve. So, yeah. um, so I found this to be really helpful and interesting. Yeah, and I hope you keep coming, Michael. Thanks. But I like your perspective added to the group too. Thanks. So we've just got two minutes left. Um, I think we have a presentation planned for Next week, um, so uh, um, and I've forgotten what it is offhand, but we'll um, we'll send it out. Should, should we should we have a presentation about the open service broker as well? I'm not sure if we have that scheduled already. That seems to be relevant. I think that's a great idea. In in what respect? Because there really isn't any security aspect to the OSB API. Oh, really? No, I think there definitely is. I mean, the, the, the app identity seems to be have, have been broken by it. For well, uh, yes, the, you you can pass in an app identity, and yet it passes around credentials, but it doesn't really. It, okay. It, it doesn't really do a whole lot in terms of helping you with security, other than it passes around credentials. All right. We can talk about how it passes around credentials and whether there are ways to improve that, since it has such a big impact on so many platforms right now. Okay. Yeah, I guess we could talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think more generically, just understanding that there's this. The goal is having this generic API where anyone can go and ask for services and have those services spun up uh, and then start consuming those services. You have to ask yourself, like, how do you restrict access to just spinning anything up, right? It would be really, Doug, maybe you, you can find the person who's thinking about, like, how do you, like, issues of trusting services and, and dishing out access and whether, um, the open service broker has all the controls it wants to have or whether, you know, their cost, like the, the people implementing it are asking for things that maybe need to come from the platforms. Maybe there's somebody who has been focused in developing that area who could kind of talk to um, how it uses the services and, and off. I think particularly key management is kind of a big deal. So I can talk to some of that, but I think I'm probably going to need a little more information to, uh, before I can identify the right person for the rest of the stuff. So what I could do is at some, a future call, and unfortunately I don't know when, because I'm at DockerCon next week, and after that I'm traveling in Asia for a couple weeks. Um, but the next time I'm on, I could talk about the various uh, data that flows back and forth, how the open source broker gets or does its job relative to credentials. And then from that, hopefully you guys can then say, okay, here's the problem we want to talk more about, and then I can identify the right person to talk about that or to bring them in. Does that make sense? That's great. And I think we have a, a couple of presentations already lined up, so whenever you're, you're back and free, it would be fabulous. Okay, sounds good. Um, so I want to be respectful of everybody's time. It's um, 12.01. So um, thank you so much, um, Jerry and Michael, for your presentations. And please feel free to um, review the notes, and if we got anything wrong or – you want to add color or links? I tried to add some links into the slide, into the notes, but um, please, they're editable by everybody. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one.